So during this retreat we have a good opportunity settling in now in our second day and a good number of days to go. During the time after the meal uh, from the 115 sitting session and the walking session I'm going to leave you in the good hands of Ajahn Pagro. I'm going to be taking that time to review some of the material I want to go over. And uh, so in the next few days, I'm going to give a commentary on the Anapanasati Sutta, the foundation of our practice. We keep coming again and again during this retreat. We're taking Anapanasati as our main method. And in a couple of days, I want to read from a talk given by Ajahn Anand which is actually a very profound talk. He talks about how he cultivated samadhi and developed his insight. And actually this talk explains his attaining of uh, several of the stages of enlightenment. So I just want to be able to, you can understand why I want to take a little bit of time to read it through. And when I read that very profound dhamma, to uh, read it with, presence of mind and it might require some commentary, a little bit of qualification of certain terms and uh, as a lead up to that today, when he talks in that talk that I'll be reading, he talks about how he cultivated the Brahma Viharas, Metta and Compassion, Mudita, Equanimity and how he contemplated death and in particular how he contemplated the not-self nature of the body by breaking it into parts and breaking it into elements and investigating it. And that combination of practices enabled Tanajan to, uh, with insight, uproot greed, hatred and delusion. So it's very profound. It is great compassion and kindness that he shares his personal experience to that extent. And it's good to read these things and hear these things because it shows us where our practice is going. In some respects, these teachings are a bit above our level. But we read them because they give us something like a blueprint, a sense of where the practices that we're doing lead to and go. And if we have confidence, the first of the spiritual powers, if we have confidence in these practices, these simple tools, if we realize that these tools, if we have enough sati, if we have enough samadhi, and if we're consistent, if we realize that these basic meditation methods will destroy delusion and place the mind in liberation, then we embrace them a little more wholeheartedly. But we also have to be a bit careful because sometimes we read uh, the introduction to the Anapanasati Sutra is amazing because you've got the Buddha explaining that uh, monks and nuns are attaining Sotapanna and stream entry, you know, non-returning arahantship left, right and center in scores. That's the introduction to the Sutta. And Ajahn Anand, when we read, go through his talk, Ajahn Anand, he seems to be going through paths and stages at quite a remarkable pace. But it is the case that how quickly people develop insights and how fast the path we progress along the path and how completely the path is able to destroy greed, hatred and delusion, it does also depend on practice in past lives. So it's not just a matter of having the right method, it's also a matter of having practiced those methods long enough that they become very powerful because the habits of greed, hatred and delusion are very deep. If we've been having these uh, countless lives where we have been affected by greed, hatred and delusion, so that habit is a very, very deep habit. So the spiritual powers really need to be very powerful before they can actually destroy them. But what we can do is we can have what Ajahn Anand refers to as temporary liberation from Kileza and from the hindrances and we derive confidence and we derive inspiration from that. We see that if we use these methods sincerely and practice to the extent that we can, that 
the mind does have breaks from its hindrances and the mind can put down its kilesas and then sure enough they come back but at least we glimpse the mind when it isn't affected by the hindrances or at least when the hindrances become more subtle by maintaining this consistent awareness and this morning reading from Ajahn Chah he's quite exacting in what he's asking us to do and he doesn't suffer fools as you'll notice from his tone but this is our good fortune that we have these masters who are telling it like it is and speaking from a, a space of tough love as it were you know when Ajahn Chah says all this laughing all this crying is the business of fools and it's something that you're doing and uh, stop doing it it requires a certain uh, capacity to take responsibility doesn't it it's very humbling of course when he was giving the talk if you were there you would have felt his metta so Ajahn Chah and his masters Ajahn Mahabur as well they give quite scolding talks but the people listening to the talks can feel the purity and the loving kindness coming from the master and it gives them uh, confidence so with regards to the contemplation of not self and the development of loving kindness I'll be reading uh, about that and a little bit later today I think I'll give a guided meditation just to I've been doing a little bit of this anyway but I'll give a guided meditation and we just understand that these basic methods are to be cultivated over a long time and deepened and deepened and then we'll see eventually where they go for some people faster than others but as I was saying in this retreat we'll be able to use these methods to experience some peace and Ajahn Chah was saying if we really do sit in that seat taking a position of that which knows holding Buddha in mind consistently at least when the various forms of greed and hatred and delusion arise the mind knows them and isn't fooled completely by them and their influence on the mind is less so even in that experience it's not as if it's all just suffering until enlightenment the extent to which we have these five spiritual powers is the extent to which we're already suffering less so it's good to feel confident that you have good tools and that you can do this work and that we're already getting some good results and to take encouragement and heart from the results that you do get and just understanding that the results get better and better if we are consistent and diligent so what Ajahn Chah was requiring of us in the talk that I was reading earlier today that not believing the mind's delusions and seeing them for what they are in a way it's easy to say isn't it it's easy to tell people to do but because the habits of the mind are quite deep uh, we do get swayed and so there are these methods if one can't just stay consistently in the, with that which knows and not identifying if we are being swayed by these kilesas then there's things that we do to weaken them and bring the mind into balance so loving kindness is a way that we brighten the mind and weaken the tendency towards aversion and it's also a way that we encourage ourselves when we're struggling and the active contemplation of not self is very helpful when we find that we are identified with something we actually investigate the body and truly investigate not self and you'll find that there is this uh, small insight we see that there really isn't a me a mine in this group of elements and we're able to let go of our identification our reaction so we have to use these things this is Yoniso Manisakara skillful reflection I'm just going to give a little personal story of an experience I had with Ajahn Anand as a very junior monk where he instructed me to cultivate metta and develop perceptions of not self it's a kind of a humorous story and I tell it as a, a way of encouraging you but also to get a glimpse uh, at the teacher's metta and his uh, on that occasion pretty amazing sense of timing I just want to check in this room when Ajahn Anand came and taught in Kuala Lumpur recently how many people went to see him very good 
and a few people went and stayed at Wat Mat Chan last year, and a few people are going again this year to Wat Mat Chan. Very good. So we can deduce that this group of people has karmic connection with Ajahn Anand. It's very good. When I was, it was my second pantha, and I was at Wat Mat Chan Tanajan Monastery. And I was one of two Western monks, and I think there were about 25 monks in those days. I think there's about 80 now, but there was about 25 monks, and it was a much smaller monastery. And uh, on many weekdays, hardly any cars came into the monastery at all. There were more visitors on the weekends, but the weekdays were very quiet. And the Thai monks, very few of them spoke any English, and so I couldn't speak much Thai. And uh, it had advantages and disadvantages. The advantage was I wasn't doing, I wasn't spending much time talking. And I had a lot of time for meditation and I was doing a lot of meditation, so that was very useful. The downside was when the Thai monks were talking about me and laughing at me, and I didn't know what they were saying, that I could feel hurt and paranoid. And that wasn't so helpful. But I remember we had this chore time. In those days, the monks would meet at one place and, and we would clean one hole together and then we would sweep leaves together from one hole down the hill and around another hole and then we would clean the eating hall. So about 15 monks would do this together. Now for Thais, they would enjoy that experience mostly because Thais like to do things as a group. But uh, having been born and grown up in Australia, it's a more of an individualist culture and it, it used to drive me crazy because I just used to think, why can't they just break it up? Why can't five monks clean one hole, five monks sweep leaves, and five monks clean the other hole? But what was really annoying for me was they had different cloths for different things in the sala. So one cloth was for windows, one cloth was for window frames, one cloth was for the floor, one cloth was for the shrine, one was for the Buddha statue. And I couldn't read Thai. So we would come, and I, you know, you're trying to look like you, you want to look like you know what you're doing, and you don't want to appear stupid. <laughs> and so you grab a cloth, and you try to ask somebody which cloth is this, and and sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they're not helpful. But if you got it wrong, sure enough, someone would come and tell you, that's not the window cloth, that's the shrine cloth. And so that was a bit frustrating. But anyway. And then the other thing is the leaf sweeping. We used to sweep the leaves so that there wasn't one single leaf left. We're talking about a forest. We didn't sweep the whole forest, but you sweep the car park area and the area around the sala and the road. And so we'd be sweeping as a group, and we'd be sweeping until there was no leaves at all. And I just used to get very frustrated. I just think, can't we just leave a few leaves? Because... As soon as you finish sweeping, the leaves are still falling. By the time you go and have tea, there's like, you know, a lot of leaves. But no, we had to sweep until there was no leaves, and you had to do it as a group. Now the other thing is, Westerners have more sweat glands than ties. And we sweat more. And because we sweat more, we smell more. And because you have to do this as a group, of course, about halfway through the chores time, the Thai monks would start making comments about how much I smelt and how much I sweated. And so this combination of factors was, was very irritating. And I remember one day, it was the uh, sala cleaning time. We'd cleaned one sala and we'd swept the leaves and we were cleaning another hall. And I remember I just couldn't take it anymore. I really couldn't take it anymore. And so in the middle of the hall, I sat down and I had... The monks have that uh, smaller cloth under their robe. And I just didn't want to see anybody, and I didn't want to hear anything, and I, I didn't know what to do. So I actually pulled the cloth over my face. And I sat in formal meditation posture in front of the Buddha. This was in the middle of chores time. And uh, I just turned inwards. I just, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> and funny enough, the mind actually became quite peaceful because there was so much frustration and so much irritation and nothing I could see outside could give me any uh, comfort 
And so I just turned inwards and I just was with my breath. And I didn't have tea that day and I walked up the hill. Now something interesting happened. As I was walking up the hill, Arjuna Nun was standing in the middle of the road alone. And uh, so I met him on the path and it was just he and I. And I fell to my knees in front of him and I said, Arjuna, when will it ever get any better? And he looked at me and he, he gave a multifaceted teaching which was bittersweet. Uh, good advice, and very painful advice. When he looked at me and he said, Achalo, in five years it's going to be better. <laughs> that was not what I wanted to hear. I wanted him to say, you'll be enlightened in five minutes. But what he was doing was he was, he was making me realize, you know, there's a lot of desire mind and there's a lot of attachment and there's a lot of desire for results. And so, he, you know, Western monks tend to be very willful and very idealistic. And uh, because they've come a long way, they're seeking to do the best thing and, and uh, they want to try really hard. But you can't push yourself to have more spiritual faculties than you have. It's a process. You have to develop them. And then he said, and in ten years, it'll be even better. Then, in a way, that was very disarming. There was this kind of sense of... Oh, but then the next thing he said, which was very valuable, he said, I recommend for you, Tanachalo, that you cultivate loving-kindness meditation for the first five to ten minutes of every meditation sit. And that was very good advice. And the other advice he says, and I recommend that you contemplate not self. Hundreds of times, thousands of times, tens of thousands of times. So, really good advice, and really humbling advice as well, but very practical. And when I was reading just now uh, the talk that Ajahnan was describing his enlightenment experiences, he was using metta and he was using contemplation of not-self. So, these methods are what will lead us to liberation. And they're applicable from the stage of being crumpled on the floor, crying and lamenting, poor me, right up to the level of becoming an arahant. So it's good to feel confident that we can embrace these practices and they're helpful for wherever we're at. So if we're really struggling, probably not going to develop metta jhana at a time when you're really struggling, but when you have metta for yourself in your struggle, it's uh, encouraging, isn't it? You being kind to yourself, nourishing your efforts with friendliness and goodwill, wishing yourself well. And with contemplations of not-self, even if we're not at the level of using the contemplation of not-self like a, a razor cutting out uh, delusion, uh, it does weaken the grasping of the sense of self a little. And if there's a large sense of self and a lot of the sense of suffering, being able to let go a little is very helpful. So uh, we'll keep coming back to these practices of breath meditation and the metta bhavana and the contemplation of not-self. And so for the remainder of this uh, teaching session, I'd like to lead us in guided meditation. We'll start with metta and then we'll move into a body contemplation. So if everybody settles into their meditation posture. So just establishing the breath awareness. Aware of the breath at the nose, chest and abdomen. And aware as the breath leaves the body, abdomen, chest, nose.
when training in breath awareness is very helpful if we can bring an attitude of both interest and care there's a sense of caring for the breath or attending to that awareness of the breath the perceptions of the breathing so in the very awareness that we bring having a look at the attitude and trying to drop any kind of willfulness any kind of excessive determination to squeeze the breath, hold the breath, control the breath. What we're aiming for is just to know it as it is. And so, to know something as it is, you just have a really good look at it. You're just interested. And if you have an attitude of being interested and then caring, so when you care for something, you take care of it. You give a a particularly attentive attention towards the things that you care for. It's like, suppose you have a friend comes to visit and you love your friend very dearly, you meet them at the door. You're very aware of your friend, so trying to bring that kind of care to the breath as it comes in and stays for a while and leaves. And we can use the butto, breathing in but, breathing out do. This butto, an encouragement to be awake, mindful, not projecting into the future, content. To be in the body, in the present moment, aware of one in-breath, but aware of one out-breath, do. When we practice mindfulness of breathing, we try to be aware of the beginning, the middle, and the end of the in-breath. The beginning, the middle, and the end of the out-breath. And also those spaces. After the in-breath, there's a pause, a space. And after the out-breath, a pause. So we attend to those feelings, knowing them, nose, chest, abdomen, abdomen, chest, nose, and then we rest in the space, just staying still. In a minute or so, we'll be moving on to the metta, loving-kindness meditation. And then after that, we'll do some contemplation of the body. When doing contemplation of the body, it is important to also have done some metta, because it's a little challenging to the habitual way we perceive ourselves. So 
important to come from an attitude of caring. We're going to investigate the body because we want to be peaceful, we want to be wise, and we don't want to be pushed around by these energies of greed, hatred and delusion, so we investigate the truth of the body, but it can be a little confronting. So it's important that we do it, not from any sense of aggression. We actually do it with a healthy self-interest. It's because we care for our well-being. It's because we are fed up with suffering. That we want to experience a reality not affected by delusion. So we investigate, looking for the truth. So we have to do this with an attitude of kindness. We do it because we care. So getting in touch with that attitude of caring, getting in touch with that attitude of wishing ourselves well, and we use the breath, we make the wish. Just as when we're doing Anapanasati, breathing in, put, breathing out, do. When we're doing the metta, breathing in, we use those words, may I be well. Breathing out, we use those words, may I be happy. Breathing in, may I be well. Breathing out, may I be happy.
So we use the metta to drop the judgments. As we've been talking about a lot, the mind needs objects. Sometimes the objects that we hold in mind are negative. And so we pick up a wholesome object and the negative ones fall away. And picking up metta, the mind becomes wholesome. And dropping cynicism, self-aversion, grudge, any kind of habitual negativity that we hold in the mind. And dropping all of that. And allowing acceptance, goodwill, friendliness, kindness. And simple kind good wishes. Wishing the best for oneself. Establish that as an attitude, it's a divine attitude. And then with that attitude, we just condense that's the meaning of those simple words may I be well, may I be happy. And so, breathing in, we're sincere in our wish, sincerely wishing, may I be well, and allowing that warmth to feel the heart area. Breathing out, may I be happy. Metta is sometimes also described as unconditional love. Sometimes that phrase means more to some people. So with the metta you're offering an attitude of unconditional love. Breathing in, may I be well. Allowing unconditional love to arise in the heart. Breathing out, may I be happy, radiating unconditional love, embracing, suffusing the whole chest, upper body, face, spreading out that attitude, divine attitude of loving kindness, filling the body. Breathing in, may I be well. Allowing unconditional love. Breathing out, may I be happy. Radiating unconditional love, acceptance, warmth throughout the whole body. Just holding it in the heart.
of having established awareness of the breath, having generated some loving kindness, now we'll move into a mode of having a sincere, honest look at the body. Just with a an honest sense of inquiry. So it's important to understand that as we look at the parts of the body, it's not like a biology experiment where you cut open a frog. You don't bring that kind of dissecting attitude to it. The attitude that we bring to it is the attitude of a love of truth and an interest in understanding what it's all about, how does it all really work. And what is this body and why am I attached to it? These are honest questions that wise people ask. And so just bringing your attention, as we do this, you still try to be aware of the breath, but not in as refined a detail. Basically aware as the breath comes in and out, this is helping you to keep your mindfulness in your body. But it's a broader awareness, because we need to move the attention through the body, not just the nose, chest, abdomen. So broadly aware of the in-breath, broadly aware of the out-breath, and moving awareness. And so bringing the awareness to your hair, and just aware of the hair, it's actually quite a dry part of the body. So just having a sense for the dryness, Whereas your skin might feel a little more moist, there's more water element passing through the skin, but on the hair it's very clear. There's this dry element. It's actually earth element. So just having a sense for the hair, looking at it as one thing, as one part. And then we just sincerely ask, is the hair self? Is this hair then me? And so we're just asking an honest question, making an inquiry. We have to do it sincerely, we really ask. And then seeing this hair, this earth element, this dry earth element growing out of the skin, And we ask, is it really mine? encourage you now to move your attention to your nails, your fingernails, just moving the awareness, still aware of the in and out breath, but just moving the awareness, the mind's awareness to the nails. And we're not thinking about them so much rather than just holding the awareness and that perception in mind and having a look. 
is just that nails. And what are they like? again you'll see that there's a, a dryness to them. And compared to flesh, they're quite hard. And just looking at the nails as one part, we just ask, are these nails self? Are these nails me? And are they really mine? I'm still aware of the in and out breathing, knowing one in breath, knowing one out breath, keeping the awareness within the body. And now I ask you to bring your attention to the area of the teeth. I'm just holding the awareness at the area of the teeth. And getting a sense for teeth. What are they like? They're very hard. The upper teeth, the lower teeth, are like rows of stones. Little white stones. Earth element. And you can consider in the past, once a tooth fell out, and you held it in your hand. Could you consider it to be a part of you anymore? And so just sincerely asking, are these teeth? Are they self? And really looking closely, bringing the awareness into that area of the teeth and having a look, what are they really? If they're not self, what are they? Once again asking, are these teeth, are they me? And seeing them as earth elements.
and coming back to the awareness of the breathing. Aware of one in-breath, aware of one out-breath. I'm just going to ask you to investigate one more body part in a few more moments, but just stabilizing that awareness on the breath one more time. Keeping the awareness in the body in the present moment. Keeping the mind steady in a gentle steadiness. I'd like you now to turn your attention inwards. I'm just going to have a look at the bones in the rib cage and the backbone. If you can just get a sense for, you don't have to visualize it, but just placing the awareness and bringing it to bear upon being aware of these bones in this body. There's a rib cage that supports the skin and there's a spine that supports us sitting now I'm just getting a sense for those bones part of a skeleton and just aware of the backbone this uh, hard straight And just considering if it wasn't surrounded by blood and lymph and flesh. What's it like just as a part? Separate from the other parts. And then asking once again, is this backbone, are these ribs, a self? And just making that honest inquiry and being receptive to the answer. this backbone me
And now once again coming back to the awareness of breathing, aware of one in-breath, aware of one out-breath. And refining the awareness to be more aware of more detail of the in and out breathing now. We can return to butto, breathing in but, breathing out do. Trying to be aware of the entire breath beginning, middle, end of the breath, in-breath, a pause, a space, the beginning, the middle and the end of the out-breath. Many people find if you do sincere investigation into the nature of the body, the sense of self becomes significantly less and it can be easier to be with the breath, just the breath, not a self, not my breath, just one in-breath and one out-breath. Breathing in put, breathing out down. Investigating Dhamma, investigating truth. And maintaining the mindfulness in the present moment, in the body, to support our investigation. by using methods in just this way because if we develop stronger mindfulness and deeper concentration when we come to investigate in this way it can be the case that layers of delusion just fall away from the mind the habitual tendency to grasp at it as being a self or as being beautiful but just this simple investigation, bearing an awareness which is truly mindful with some concentration on these parts of the body, this practice can enlighten you. This practice can destroy greed, hatred and delusion. It does require some spiritual qualities cultivated in this and previous lives in order to be that powerful but it is useful to the extent that we can do it it's useful in the here and now helping us to lessen our grasping of the body and our thoughts and our feelings as being a self and the metta practice that we did earlier supporting the conventional self to feel safe to feel well, to feel taken care of, while it investigates not self. And there's no need to be frightened that uh, 
your entire being will be annihilated if you see that it's not self. What happens is that when you have an insight into not self, that which knows these things becomes very pronounced, the quality of awareness which is radiant, peaceful, and calm, that mindful awareness that has insight is very blissful. And so, if we see through self and if delusion falls away, the only thing that is annihilated is suffering. And what remains is an experience without suffering. So we can all be very interested in experiencing that. And there's no need to be frightened. They can be very interested in understanding and realizing our potential. The mind's capacity to see truth and be liberated from every type of suffering. But in our daily practice we experience small insights, short periods of liberation, and this is good, this is fine. You should never think that our practice will never become so grand. It does, and it will, if we keep practicing, because it's this very same practices. If we keep them up with repetition, they gain power, like any of our habits. Repetition and training give these things great power. It's karmic volition. We have the intention to cultivate wisdom and insight and we train to do it again and again. And we do it again and again. And those spiritual powers, the sati, the samadhi, the panya, does get more and more powerful. This is the Eightfold Path, factors of the Eightfold Path. And as the Eightfold Path gains momentum, it does destroy ignorance and delusion little by little. So it's okay to mindfully bow, get up and do some walking meditation now if you choose.